thinking, for many of us, is a verbal process. It involves language. It involves some kind of speech. So my interest as a developmental psychologist is in where does this language come from, what is it doing there, and what is it like, to use the technical term, what is its phenomenology? And this is where Vygotsky comes in, because Vygotsky had a lovely, clear, simple theory of how all this works. He argues that children are born into a social world. They don't have to become social, they don't have to learn to be social. They are born social, they're engaging with other people from the very first days of life. As language develops, that becomes a linguistic process of communication. So they're engaged in social dialogue from almost as soon as they've got language. And then they go through a stage of what Vygotsky called internalization, when that conversation that the child is having with another person becomes taken on into the self. And she starts to do it for herself. She conducts the entire dialogue for herself. But she's still doing it out loud. This is the stage known as private speech. So it's talking to yourself out loud, but talking to yourself. Then according to Vygotsky, there's a bit more internalization. And all that, that stuff that was going on externally becomes totally internalized. So it's just going on in the head. And that is your inner speech. That is the words in your head that you hear when you're walking to work, when you're lying in the bath, when you're preparing dinner in the kitchen. That internal conversation started out developmentally as an external conversation. focused on this area called colloquially known as Broca's area. It's sort of here in the brain. It's the left inferior frontal gyrus. And it's very, very strongly implicated in language production. If you have damage to this area, you're, you're going to have aphasia. You're going to have a problem in producing language. We looked at a second area, which is known as Heschel's gyrus. And we picked this area because it's not meant to be involved in speech production. It's meant to be involved in hearing stuff, in processing uh, speech and other sounds. It wasn't meant to be a big speech production area, so we didn't expect it to activate when people were doing in a speech. When people are doing in a speech naturally, there's nothing in broker. There's no activation or tiny amount. But there's a huge activation in this part of the brain which isn't supposed to be involved in speech. You get completely the opposite pattern of findings depending on whether you ask people to do in a speech compared to when they do it naturally and spontaneously. And we think the implications of this are pretty profound, not least for all the studies that have gone about thinking that you can study this stuff simply by telling people to do it. And I'm going to talk about an experience that many people probably wouldn't admit to, probably wouldn't relate to. I'm going to talk about the experience of hearing voices. But why am I even talking about hearing voices? Surely I'm talking about something that's very deviant, that's very unusual, that's very strange, that's very not part of everyone's experience. Well, it actually seems to have a lot in common with the thing I've been talking about up to now, the experience of inner speech. The theory is very simple. People who hear voices, according to the theory, hear a voice when they're actually just producing some inner speech. They are just talking to themselves, but for some reason, they don't recognize it as something that they themselves have done. What normally happens is that when you produce some inner speech, you're thinking to yourself, go and get the milk, it's almost like a signal is sent within your brain from that speech generation part of the brain to the speech perception area saying, don't worry too much about this thing you're about to hear because you said it. That's effectively the idea. The, the, the system, the auditory system is, is suppressed because it's getting a signal saying it was you that did that. So don't, you know, don't, don't treat it as if it were an external utterance. Don't process it in that way. Just switch off. Don't worry about it. And that seems to be what happens in the typical case. So when we're talking to ourselves, usually, that message is getting through and we're not we're not perceiving our inner speech as external. But for some reason, the theory goes, when people hear, vo hear voices, that signal doesn't get through. It's degraded, it's delayed, 
it doesn't happen at all. Something goes wrong with that signal. And so this, the message saying, don't listen to this, it's just you, doesn't get through. And so people produce them in a speech and they perceive it, they experience it as an external voice. And this is the book of Marjorie Kemp. This is it. it is, there is one of them. This is the manuscript. And this is a photograph I took of the book when I went to visit it at the British Library. It was written down in about 1440. And the reason more of you should know about Marjorie Kemp is that this book is also the first autobiography in the English language. Nobody, man or woman, had ever written about their life before in English. Why am I interested in her? Well, for all sorts of reasons, not least because she writes about her voice hearing. She writes about her experiences of hearing voices. And we've argued that these experiences resonate very neatly with the experiences of voice hearers today. Back to the book of Marjorie Kemp. Um, I mentioned that Marjorie lived in Lynn, or Kings Lynn, in Norfolk. And if you turn to this page of Marjorie's book, um, you see this interesting reference in the margin, which says, Dame Julian. And this is a reference to Julian of Norwich. She wrote the first book in English known to have been written by a woman. She was the first female writer in English, which is a pretty massive claim to fame. Um, and she's unjustly neglected. The reason I'm interested in, in Julian is because she also heard voices and saw things and had unusual experiences. So the two women met. They met almost exactly 600 years ago, we think, round about the year 1415 in Norwich. So we asked people to go into the, the scanner. This is in the uh, university scanner in Middlesbrough. Um, and in the scanner, they were asked to generate some inner speech and in two conditions. They were either doing it in a condition of a monologue, or they were doing it as a dialogue. We were able to work out what was special about the dialogic inner speech by comparing the activations when people were doing dialogic inner speech and subtracting away the activations when people were doing monologic inner speech. This is our left hemisphere language system, it's our inner speech network, and this is our right hemisphere theory of mind system. And the idea, we, we argue, that our findings support an interaction, a kind of conversation between these two different parts of the brain, one involved in language, one involved in thinking about other minds. If you put the two things together, you've got inner dialogue. Some other research that we've been doing recently suggests that more general aspects of brain development might play a role. So we had access to a sample of uh, brain scans from some patients with schizophrenia in Australia. Jane Garrison, who led the study at Cambridge, had developed um, expertise in being able to measure a particular part of the brain known as the parasingulate sulcus. And it's a little fold that's kind of deep down inside your brain towards the front. And the interesting thing about the PCS is that it varies in length. Here's a picture of somebody with a long PCS. Can you see? It's the red thing here. And here's a picture of somebody with a short PCS. I mean, you, you probably all, you won't all have a PCS. Most of you will have one. Um, and it will vary in length, hugely, between, between you. And some previous research that the team at Cambridge had been doing suggested that this particular fold in the brain correlated with how good people were at distinguishing between stuff that happened internally things that they'd imagined versus things that happened externally. So among people with schizophrenia, the length of this fold predicted how likely they were to have hallucinations. And we found that for every one centimetre that you, this particular fold was re reduced in length, these patients' likelihood of having hallucinations increased by 20%. There's a lot of interesting research still to be done. I hope I've given you a flavour of how varied the ordinary voices in our head are, but also of how varied the more unusual experience of voice hearing is.
showing you some of the connections between the two and giving you some food for thought, I guess. Um, this is the, the book, and this is it in its lovely US edition, which is uh, coming up soon. And finally, a few acknowledgements. Thank you.